Good morning, Shiloh Baptist Church family. Here are today's announcements. John 8.32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. On June 19, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger, a Union soldier during the Civil War, led soldiers to Galveston, Texas, to deliver a very important message. The war was finally over, the Union had won, and it now had the manpower to enforce the end of slavery. On June 17, 2021, Congress approved and President Biden signed into law June 19th or Juneteenth as a federal holiday recognizing black independence. Graduation drive-by. Come help, our, help honor our 2021 graduates. There is a graduation drive-by Sunday, June 27th from 11.30 a.m. to 12 noon. We ask all graduates to arrive at the church no later than 11.15 a.m. For our drive-by participants, we ask you stay in your vehicles. Drive-by committee members will meet you outside and provide you with directions. Lastly, ministry leaders, have your gifts to Sister Gwen at the church office by Wednesday, June 23rd. And last, but certainly not least, Shallow Baptist Church leadership says Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. Thank you for the lives you are changing. Thank you for the lives you have changed. We truly, truly, truly honor you and appreciate you on this day. That concludes today's announcements. Welcome everyone to Shallow Baptist Church Old Site Sunday Service. It is such a pleasure to have you with us today. Oh my gosh, I'm just fired up for the message is about to come forth today and the singing is about to be done. I'm just so excited. I hope you're excited there. You all are at home. So let's get started. Today's scripture is going to come from the book of Deuteronomy. That's in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, starting at, cha starting at chapter 8, verse 1. And it reads as this. If you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully follow all his co commands, I give you today, the Lord, your God, will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on to you and accompany you if you obey the Lord, your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come. Yes, you'll be blessed when you go out. Let us pray. Father God, most high, Lord, we just thank you for another day, another week that we've made it through, Father God. Lord, we thank you for the simple things of life, Father God. And yes, Father God, we thank you for the great. Father God, we thank you because you're not only the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you're the God of Antoine, Aisha, and Jamal. So Lord, we just bless you and we give you all the glory and all the praise. I, we ask right now your blessing be upon the choir, upon the word. Lord God, we just ask you to bless those who are sick and shut in. Lord, and finally we ask right now that you touch the message, that the singing touches the heart of those who do not know you. So they may ask, what must I, be, must, what must I do to be saved? We ask all these in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Before the choir begins to sing. I just want, something was brought to my attention. I want to talk to everyone out there, especially my seasoned saints. There is an email going on right now on Facebook, um, the title of the Global Introduction Fund. Hackers, people who mean you no good, are every day are trying to steal your identity, um, con you out of your hard-earned money. And I just want to say, do not click on any message. Um, don't respond to anybody asking you for money because chances are it's a scam. So just be vigilant, everyone. If, you, if you're in doubt, ask someone else. Uh, read the news, Google it, and, and do some investigation. But please, please, please be careful out there in social media because while there's some friends out there, not everyone's your friend. Thank you and be blessed. And the next verse, voices you will hear is none other than our wonderful choir. Amen. The Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Good morning, Shiloh, and happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. Um, the fathers to be, um, father figures, single fathers, um, and if you no longer have your father, we are praying for you on this Amen. morning. Um, we're glad that you decided to join us. Um, 
please feel free to to worship the Lord with us this morning. I know that we are, you know, should be used to this non-traditional setting. So you should definitely feel comfortable praising the Lord Amen. right in your home, right in your PJs while you're cooking breakfast, if you're in your cars. Um, and definitely share this video so that we can uh, reach the masses to share what thus said Amen. the Lord. Amen. This house shall be called a place of restoration, a place where the broken are made whole. Healing waters flow and mercy abides here. My that the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be exceedingly glad about it. Songwriter says, I love to praise his name. Hallelujah. Can we just give God a hand clap of praise?
I love to praise his name. I love to praise his name because he's done so much for us, for me. And the song says, if he never do another thing, he's already done enough. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm
God doesn't do anything else for me, he's done enough. That's a song that recognizes the goodness, grace, and mercy of our God. That's a song that reminds us that each of us ought to have an attitude of gratitude. The song reminds us that we ought not be spoiled brats. We ought not be in a position where we are not appreciative for what the Lord has already done. We ought not treat the Lord the way we sometimes treat each other. Hallelujah. We ought to bless the name of the Lord when the sun is shining. We ought to bless his name when the rain is torrentially falling to the ground. Our God is worthy to be praised 24-7, seven, seven days a week. No matter where you, whether you're up or down, he's still worthy to be praised. So grateful to God for this privilege of sharing with you one more time. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers out there. And I want to encourage you to do something as I uh, begin this message and this message process. If your father is yet alive, call him, go see him if he's nearby, and tell him thank you for being the father in my life. And if he's not here with us, if he's gone from labor to reward, you can still thank God and send those pleasant and positive thoughts in his direction. And then I want to urge you to go a little bit further to also thank God for the father figures that he's placed in your life. It may not be a biological father, but you're not a man just because you can make a baby. You're a man if you can take care of the baby. Amen. And all of us, if we would be honest, we've had men, other men, besides our biological fathers, who poured into our lives to help shape us to become the persons that we are today. And we salute them as well. And at the conclusion of the sermon, I will uh, come back to you with a Father's Day note. Uh, that I, One last thing I want to request of you on this Father's Day. You don't, you don't have to rush to the restaurants today. Amen. You can get a seat anywhere you want to go. So just bear with me for a little while. Turn with me, if you will, to the physician's gospel, the gospel of Luke. Luke, in a very familiar text in chapter 15, we lift these words up, hoping that in the words of my dear mentor, the late Dr. Charles E. Booth, that we can dip a bucket into an old well and bring forth fresh water. Luke chapter 15, hear what the Lord has to say, beginning at verse 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. And I ask that you would skip down with me uh, to the latter, latter part of this text. It says that there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together with all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild living, for he had spent everything. There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed for his stomach to be filled with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him 
in the distance and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this my son was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of our God. I want to share with us for the next little while from the subject. A father who waits. A father who waits. Luke begins this very familiar text by offering some valuable and vital information. It tells us that Jesus spent precious and valuable time with all kinds of people during his ministry. Jesus has gathered around him at the time of this text, at the dinner table, if you will, persons with not so sterling reputations. Jesus has around him people with seedy characters. He has around him people uh, who perhaps you wouldn't want to be around. But Jesus shared a meal with them, and Luke describes those persons as tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors and sinners. As I look at this designation of two kinds of people, I wonder what kind am I? And simultaneously, I wonder what kind are you? Jesus spends time with tax collectors and sinners. The tax collectors were Jews who work for the Roman version of the IRS. Tax collectors, brothers and sisters, were persons who, uh, just like their title suggests, they collected taxes from fellow Jews with a by any means necessary approach. They shake you down. They shake you up. They do whatever they had to do to get their money. That meant that they would extract, put the squeeze on, get butter from a duck if necessary in order they might collect those taxes. Whatever the Romans assessed as a person's tax for that year, uh, whatever the tax collector got beyond that went in their pockets. It went in their coffers. It went in their bank account. The tax collecting business, uh, as you can imagine, was quite lucrative. Tax collectors made money hand over fist. Tax collectors lived lavish lifestyles. Tax collectors wore fine silk clothing imported from China. Tax collectors wore elaborate jewelry, gold chains, gold signet rings encrusted with rubies and diamonds. Tax collectors live a, a large life. They live in nice homes and they had all the bells and whistles of a first century home to look forward. Tax collectors dined scrumptiously on the finest foods, even foods that were not kosher according to Levitical laws. These rich and infamous, not rich and famous, these rich and infamous individuals were your first century equivalents to the Rockefellers, the Bezos, the Oprahs, the Mackenzie Scotts, and they perhaps literally lived high on the hog. They ate foods, non-kosher foods that were considered forbidding cuisine. Why not? Many of them had been cut off from their families. They had been cut off from their friends. They had been cut off from being able to go and worship in the synagogue. So they decided, like the rappers Andre 3000 and Big Boy, who were considered outcasts, scourge, dregs of society, persons non, non, persona non gratis, family and friends would shun them in public. They wouldn't even invite them to get a plate at the family picnic. But if a family or a friend needed money personally, or a donation that went towards adding a new wing to the synagogue, their money would be accepted anonymously with the credit going to someone else. Tax collectors, brothers and sisters, were looked upon as some, by some unorthodox Jews as sellouts. The tax collectors were considered to be Uncle Tom's. The tax collectors were lowlifes, dirt bags, bottom feeders, and anything and everything but a child of God. And like that old OJ's hit uh, from yesteryear, 
A fellow Jew said to, of the tax collectors, don't call them brother. When you work for the man, you don't call me brother. When you're in the bed with the clan, don't call me brother. When you're with the people who try to rip me off, don't call me brother. While the average Jew on the street didn't have much for the slimy, low-life, greasy Uncle Tom tax collectors types, the religious wise and otherwise synagogue leaders couldn't stand the ground that the tax collectors walked on. The religious leaders had total disdain for those who helped the Romans. And then comes along this carpenter turned preacher, this man whose fame had gone through the sky and was like a rock star of his day, Jesus, very God and very man, whose reputation has now shot through the roof, has all kinds of folk gathering to be close to him, trying to get as close as they possibly can. Even women and children wanted to be around Jesus. This Jesus who is a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. This Jesus, my God, that's who Jesus is and that's who he was in the first century. And might I add that Jesus, if you would be honest, is a bit unorthodox. He's not like the other religious leaders. Jesus, yeah, he's a bit different. Jesus didn't care what others said about him regarding the people that he called his friends. Let me say that again for the people in the back. Jesus didn't care what you thought about him and how you may have talked about him, how you may have thought that you were better than Jesus even because of the people that he hung around. You see, I'm happy, I'm glad, I'm excited about the fact that Jesus spent time with people who had a few problems. Uh, let me say that again. I'm glad that Jesus spent time while he walked topside of God's green earth and even now spends time with us because he walks with me. He talks with me and tells me when other people want to kick me to the curb that I am and you are, we are his own. Jesus hung around people who had issues with regards to their reputations. Jesus, according to Luke, went as far as dining, eating, fellowshipping with known sinners. Jesus spent time with people that you and I may have avoided. Jesus, I say again, spent time with people that sometime with our pious selves that we won't spend time around, not when the sun is shining. Jesus spent time with them, and he did not care one bit what you thought, not even the religious leaders. These pious, I got it all together, religious leaders in the first century of Palestine, they acted like they were the all and the end all and the be all. They thought that they were all of that and a bag of chips. And in their minds, they were the deciders and presiders. They lived by the mantra of ain't nobody right but us. They said of Jesus, you do know, you do know, Jesus, that people are known for the company they keep. You know this, Jesus. Jesus, you do know, uh, you've heard the old adage that birds of a feather flock together. Therefore, since you spend time with people that we would declare as being vultures, also known as buzzards, you must be a buzzard too. Jesus then attempts to explain to this peacock crowd, pious preacher crowd, that he is an eagle, unmistakably an eagle. And, but if he spends time with those that you call buzzards, maybe, just maybe, some of the eagle-like qualities will rub off on them. If Jesus, being an eagle, who flies high and sees everything, can spend some time with some people like you and me, then maybe, just maybe, some of his good qualities might just rub off on us. Jesus admits that his crowd, yes, they have a few problems. In the crowd that followed Jesus, there were adulterers. In the crowd that followed Jesus, there were these tax collectors. There were wine bibbers, wine o's, liars, cheats, low life, and the like. But Jesus' argument is this. They may have done what you said they did, but they are not who you say they are. They may have done what you said they did. They did do it, but they are not who you say they are because their story is still being written. 
their story has not reached its climax, its conclusion. Now, it has not reached the end. You see, God's love is not just for the righteous. Praise his holy name. God's love is not just for folk who have it all together. God's love is not just for the people who live in gated communities, but God loves the homeless. God loves the rejects and the dregs of society. Jesus argues that these people can become exes. Jesus says these people who you now look down on can become exes. What do you mean, Jesus? They can become ex-wine bibbers, ex-prostitutes, ex-pimps and hustlers, ex-troublemakers, ex whoremongers, ex-liars, ex-cheats. And even so, Jesus says God loves them even as he loves you because we serve a God of another chance. The highly educated with an equally high opinion of themselves, the religious leaders didn't understand. They didn't understand this. They had been to school, but they were rather slow when it came to understanding and connecting the dots with Jesus. That's why I love Jesus so. That's why I love him so. He was willing and he's still willing to bring the knowledge down to where the people are. So Jesus told them this story. He told them a story about a lost uh, sheep that a shepherd had, had come up missing in his fold and he went in search for the sheep, left the others uh, where they were and went after that one and did not stop until he found that one and rejoined the 99 and the one and all were well. They still didn't get it. They were a little bit slow. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus told them another story about a woman, a woman who had come in her possession with 10 precious silver coins, very valuable. But she finds one of them has now been lost. And the Bible says she turned it out. She turned the house upside down. She looked everywhere. She lit a candle. She, she swept the floor. She did all that she could and would not stop and did not stop until she found the coin that was lost. They still didn't get it. Some people are just riding the short bus, spiritually speaking. They don't get it. Finally, Jesus tells them this third story, hoping that they would connect the dots, hoping that the third time would indeed be a charm. He said a father had two sons. The younger one had the nerve to go to his daddy one day violating all protocol and went to his father and said, hey pops, uh, uh, how you doing today? I'm fine, son. What's on your mind? Pops, I need you to write me a check and give me my inheritance now. I know I'm supposed to wait until you pass away and it's in your will, but since I'm here and you're alive, I want you to hear about the stories of my success. So can you invest in me? Can I have my check now, please? I can't wait. I can't wait until you die. You, your family members live a long time. I may not even live as long as you. It's slow around here in this little town. It's boring around here. I need to get to a place where the bright lights are and where the big city is. Luke calls that place the far country. Do you know that place? It's on your GPS, it's in your map, and I got a sneaky suspicion that every one of us, you, me, and all of us, have been either in the far country or at least we passed through. When he first get to the city, all is well. He puts down his, his black card at every place he goes, and he can buy up the place and buy drinks for all of his so-called friends, and he's doing fine on cloud nine. He's living it up. He's living it up, and it seems like he would never, ever come down. But he's having a ball. He's spending money. He's buying the best food. He's wearing the best of clothing. He's staying in the best of hotels. He's having a different lady each night. It's right here in the text. And all is well. All is well. The drinks keep flowing. The food keeps coming. But Newton's third law also comes into effect, which loosely translate, what goes up must come down. And down it came. It came crashing down like the stock market in 1929. No more money. He's broke, busted, and disgusted. No more money. Uh, his good name has gone to shame. Uh, he's no longer given credit. His credit 
Church are no longer loaning him money, hoping that things would change for him. The bubble burst. The bottom fell out. He's hit hard times. And now he's gone, not from rags to riches, but in the reverse. He's gone from riches to rags. So bad now, he's got to find a job. At his daddy's house, he had servants. Whatever he wanted, they brought it to him. Whatever he needed, they honored that need. Whatever he thought he wanted, they'd take care of it. He ring a little bell, and they fill his cup with whatever he wanted to drink. He, ring, they ring, he rings another bell, and they bring him all kinds of scrumptious food. But now, the money's gone. Now, he's broke, busted, and disgusted. And he's feeding hogs, because that's the only job he can get. He's feeding the hogs. That was bad enough. As a fine Jewish boy growing up in a home where hogs were not considered kosher, I could not have been of that religious persuasion. I love the pork chops. I love the ham. I even love the chitterlings. But he comes to himself and he decides, I can't eat what the hogs are eating. Things are hard, but I, they're not that hard. I, I've got another idea. The light comes on for him. He decides and says to himself, self, I believe. I'll go back home. I believe I'll go back home because in my father's house, uh, the servants have plenty of food that they're able to share with family and friends. In my father's house, the servants don't even wear the same clothes twice. But now I'm out here in this far country, and I got to make up my mind and get myself together and come up with a good, convincing speech Ask my father to beg, plead my father with my father to give me another chance. He's walking, talking, thinking to himself, rehearsing his speech. I tell daddy, look, I just, uh, look, I, I messed up. I messed up. You were right. I messed up. But uh, I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But can I at least get hired as one of the servants here in your compound? Can I at least become again, a member of the family extended wise and become a member of your staff. I'm willing to do that, Daddy, if you give me another chance. Father, the text says, Luke writes that he saw the son afar off. Before he got back to the mansion, before he came to the compound, the father saw his son. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that every day, the father looked out on the horizon. Sometimes he would see a silhouette. Sometimes it would be a, a stranger. And he wondered to himself, is this my son finally coming back home? And each time before that time, he was disappointed. This time he waited patiently. He did not want to jump the gun, if you will. He did not want to go out there and find somebody else. He didn't want to deal with that disappointment. But the figure that was once just shadowy, now becomes clear. It looks like his son, but he's got a beard. He looks like his son, but he looks like, yeah, like he's, he's fallen on hard times. It looks like my son from a distance, but he doesn't look like he looked when he first left my house. He keeps on staring. He keeps on looking. And finally says, beneath that beard, beneath the rat, tattered clothes, that is my boy. That's my son. And the father violates a Jewish father's protocol. The Bible says he runs to his son. That's something we wouldn't do. But a Jewish father was never supposed to run to a junior. It was for the junior to run to the senior. The son runs to the father, not the other way around. But the father doesn't care because, uh, mind you, they're not wearing pants. They're wearing tunics, long dresses, if you will. And when you are running, you can't run in them. Come on, help me, ladies. You can't run in them. Lord have mercy, unless you listen to my grandma and say, you got to hike it up a little bit. <laughs> Serious business. They're running. He's running towards his son, but he has to pull up his tunic. Yes. So that he can stride as fast as he can. And because he's running, this old man is running, he's starting to show part of his inner thigh. Are you listening? Are you hearing? Are you seeing this picture? He's running and he's showing parts of himself that are not permitted to be seen publicly, but he does not care one hill of beans what you think about it. Uh, 
Uh, some of us spend our whole lifetime worrying about what they say. But what about what he says? Some of us spend our whole lifetime being governed by the barometer of public opinion. Do you not know that there are some folk, if you gave them a million dollars right now, they still won't like you? They'll say, why didn't he give me two? Why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? There are some folk who just don't like you, and that's their problem, not yours. You just got to make sure you're on the Lord's side. The father doesn't care what protocol calls for. He runs to his son, and he says, I wish somebody would. I wish somebody would say something to me. I believe he might have been packing, had his nine millimeter at his side. But he goes to his son. Son falls on the ground prostrate. Says, Father, I messed up, and I messed up bad. I went out full, but I've come home empty. I went out full of ambition and hope, but I've come back ratted, ratted and tattered. All of my hopes and dreams were lost in the far country. Please, please give me a job here as one of your hired servants. The father said, I won't hear, have any of this. Calls for the servants, bring him a new robe. He's, he's rough looking. I believe he probably said to somebody who's not in the text, bring him some soap and water, let him clean up himself. Bring him a signet ring that says, you steal my son. It has the family crest on it. Bring him, yes, yeah, shoes for his feet. Bring him all of these things because now he's restored. He's my son. He was my son under my roof. He was my son in the far country. And now that he's come back, he's still my boy. That's my son. That's my boy. He embraces him. He kisses him, the text says. He lavishly loves on him and tells him, I don't care what you did, you're still mine. I remember when I worked in the penal system as a counselor at a maximum security prison, there were men there, warehoused like animals, and some of them had done some terrible, heinous things. Uh, but on visiting day, mostly on Saturday, some of those mothers coming from almost to where the West Virginia line lies, would come to Southampton County and visit with their sons. They would visit with their sons as though they had won the Nobel Prize. They would visit with their sons as though they had done something noteworthy. They would visit with their sons because even with a criminal record, even sometime with life sentences, it was still their son. No matter how great their love was, it does not compare to what Luke is trying to tell us or what Jesus is trying to tell the people of his day and trying to tell us now, you don't throw people away just because they mess up. Lord have mercy. Some people don't hear me yet. You messed up. I messed up. All of God's children have messed up, but folk gave you another chance and how you pay it forward is by giving somebody else another chance. Thank you, Holy Ghost. This is Jesus telling a parable, but since I am listening to his story, we've all listened to his story. Could it be that the father in this text also had a moment like his son in his younger days? Could it be he was letting his hair down and sowing his wild oats, but he came to himself and his father gave him another chance? That's who God is. And if we declare that we are children of God, we have to act like God towards one another. In God's economy, everybody is valuable. In God's economy, you don't throw anybody away. Everybody is somebody in the Lord. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, I'm talking to you. It may have been a long time ago, but you sinned, you fell short. And why would you look down on young folk today? Because they are doing some of the same things you did. You just got older. And sometimes you got a few more sense, but sometimes you just had equipment failure. Are you hearing me? And so you and I don't have within our, uh, our wherewithal to throw somebody under the bus and throw them away. Our God is a God of another chance. This father in our text, this wasn't the first day that he looked out on the horizon. I already mentioned that. But he was a father who waited and waited, and waited, and waited some more for his son to come home. His prayer was, Lord, let me live long enough 
to see my boy come home. Lord, bless me with a few more days that I might see my boy come to his senses and leave the far country and come back home. And he was, wish, he's grant, he was granted his wish. God gave him the blessing privilege of seeing his son come back. I want to say to somebody before I take my seat, that Father, the Heavenly Father, our God, is still the Father who waits. He's waiting for you right now. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what they said you did. I don't care what they caught you on camera doing. He's still waiting. He's waiting right now, tenderly waiting, tenderly calling just for you. I hear you. I hear you. You're saying, Pastor, I messed up. I'm tore up from the flow up. I missed the mob. Haven't we all? Yes, haven't we all? Sometimes it's not the sin of what we do. Sometimes it's the sin of what we don't do. Sometimes we're guilty, even though we believe that we are not guilty by our inactivity. But inactivity is a sin. God has given us another chance. Why can't we give somebody else a chance? Why can't we be like the father in this text who represents God? who does not burn bridges, who does not write people off like a bad check, who does not just throw people in the garbage, but he believes this story tells us that there is something redeemable about you. Yes, you messed up. Yes, you missed the mark. Yes, all of this is true. But I hear the Lord saying, I won't dare throw you away. He's speaking to you right now. I know what you did last summer and the summer before that. I know what you're doing right now, but I won't give up on you. And since I won't give up on you, don't you give up on you. God is calling. His Father is waiting in this text. Our Heavenly Father is waiting right now for your time of decision. Decide, make it your mind that I'm going to follow him. I'm going to come home. I'm going to leave the far country and go to my Father. door of the church is open. Perhaps there's somebody who's hearing the voice speaking to your heart saying come home. He's waiting. He's ready. He's willing. But are you? You see God is all powerful and all loving. He could make us come. But he doesn't want it like that. Lord have mercy. <sighs> Our God is not a spiritual rapist. He wants you to come freely. He wants you to come of your own free will, your own choice. Won't you come? Today is the day of salvation. When you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He's ready, are you? We've done as the Lord has asked, and still there's room at the cross for you and you and, yes, even you. I said that it was a final piece to this Father's Day message. I, I miss my father every day. I miss my father every day. He passed almost three years ago on July 4th, 2018 father no longer physically is here but I feel him every day I feel the Reverend O.C. Dobines my daddy my hero every day but I've talked to a number of folks they don't have the same relationship with their father did not have the same relationship with their father that, that I have I realize my brothers and I are blessed but this is what I want to say let me let me, let me say this clearly. Let me say, let me say this clearly. Just keep playing, but just a little bit. I, I, this, the Lord laid this on my heart. If by chance you were not blessed with a father who was loving and supportive, my heart goes out to you. But I want to say to you, you need to release that and let it go. Because you're still here, you're successful. And there's nothing you can do about changing 
what has been. I want you to be willing and able to forgive your father so you can move on. It's not for him if that's your story. It's for you because you're being held hostage. You're being tied in knots because of what father did or did not do. The Lord has a word for you just as he said to those disciples about providing transportation going into Jerusalem. He said, go and find the coats and loose them and let them go. There's some loosing that needs to be done. There's some loosing and releasing that you need to do, not for him, but for you. So that you can fulfill your destiny of all that God wants you to be. Sometimes we go through some rough patches in life. Sometimes we have rough experiences so that we will share with others. I went through something similar, but God brought me through. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody. The Lord laid it upon my spirit to say to you, release him, release them, and let it go so that you can freely move to the next level of where God is trying to take you. Let us now receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us now and forevermore. And together we declare, amen, amen.